Welcome back to Dementia Basics Online. Today is our last session, part six, the caregiving experience. Our guest speaker today is Kelly Wilkinson. She's a dementia care coach at the Dementia Society of Ottawa and Renfrew County. If you have any question, please type it in, in the Q&A box or the chat box. There is going to be a Q&A at the very end of this presentation and please use handout number three provided. And I will turn over to Kelly. My name is Kelly Wilkinson, and uh, this is Monday, July 13th at 5 p.m. And this is part six of Dementia Basics, the caregiving experience. Um, so like I said, my name is Kelly Wilkinson. I'm one of 12 uh, dementia care coaches that work on the program team. So that means that we uh, support families as they journey through um, with a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's. And as you've learned, um, dementia is very much an umbrella term and many variations fall underneath it. So um, I'm also a grief counselor um, and have a practice in Ottawa. So as we've all experienced, there's been some challenging times recently and Grief is ever present, you know, ongoing grief and kind of just uh, navigating the new normal and adjusting, you know, so there's some grief there when, when it comes to the loss of, of certain things. So today what we're going to do is we're going to learn about the caregiving experience within Canada, but also within our community and also how the Dementia Society uh, supports that community and helps navigate caregivers uh, through this experience because um, for some this might be new or this is new for a different relationship. I'm just going to check our chat here. Okay, sorry. So that's just our, our information there. So I believe questions are going to be held towards the end. Um, yeah, so like I was saying, um, today is really about um, showing you what's possible in terms of equipping um, a caregiver's toolbox. So what kinds of things should you um, consider as you're taking on the role in the experience of caregiver? Now for some, it's a, it's a role that, that was gladly taken and for some, well, you might be in a professional environment and you're you know, paid to, to complete and perform this role. Or you might have had a challenging relationship with this person and yet you're responsible and in this role. So all to say is that this experience is very much unique. And, you know, depending on relationships and dynamics and family history, it's, it's really going to vary um, from family to family. Um, so with that said, we're going to click forward, like I said, past that, uh, past that video. So just uh, for the purposes of the presentation, we like to give a definition of caregiver. And we're going to go through some um, information by Stats Canada. Every few years, they collect information from caregivers and produce a report or an informational sheet, um, something that's updating the public on, on the caregiver's contribution. So this definition is kind of pulled from there just so that we can understand the, the numbers and the information a little bit better. So a caregiver is a person that provides direct care, either paid or unpaid. And some examples are daughters and sons, of course, spouses, parents, trusted friends, personal support workers, and nurses. So on the other side of the coin, um, the care recipient is a person of whom you are providing the care. So. They can include children and youth for our specific situation, seniors with aging needs, um, and again, people living with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, people with complex physical health or mental health needs. So sometimes um, these three points, so seniors with aging needs, people living with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and finally, people with complex physical health or mental health needs, these can be all uh, rolled into one. 
um, as we've learned in, in the past uh, parts of Dementia Basics. And of course, children, youth, adults with uh, special needs. So I, I mentioned briefly that um, this care, caregiving situation is very much unique. Um, the reason being is um, the you know depending on the diagnosis, the health of the individual, the family history, um, the journey can take as long as three years to thirty years. Um, dementia symptoms arrive incrementally, so it can take longer to identify the need uh, for for support. Um, so, you know, in creating or using preventative measures like, like ex cardiovascular exercise into your routine can, can help with the future. So it's important to kind of, you know, pinpoint these issues early, early on and to have an open conversation, you know, if possible with, with your loved one, with the support of family members if possible. Um, so another reason why the caregiver situation is unique is because there's very much a reversal of roles. Um, and just to uh, make a brief comment, uh, I'm just getting over a cold, so I'm sure you're hearing me pant over <laughs> reciting some of the slide decks. So my apologies. Um, but I, I'm doing just fine. Um, but I apologize for the, the heavy breaths. Um, so going back to it, so reversal of roles. So for example, in a situation of a parent and a child, um, there's an exchange of roles that slowly happens throughout time and as the dementia progresses. Um, and this takes, you know, acceptance as changes occur, acceptance of the loved one to have a trusted person take on some of those of their responsibilities that they used to manage well. <clears throat> so, um, you know, there's an emotional reality of what is happening and there's a factual, realistic, if that makes sense, real reality of what's happening. So we, we kind of have to be aware of um, what skills am I acquiring? You know, what things may I feel like I've lost? Um, how am I growing? Um, what things have I taken on? Um, you know, what things do I feel like in the future I might need to take on? Um, and talking to your friends and family about your experience and your lived experience throughout this is, is important for this reversal of roles of why it makes caregiving um, so unique for people with dementia. Um, caregivers can experience a dual loss. So the loss of memories and personality traits, the physical loss of the individual, and even the, the way you used to communicate and the, um, uh, the back and forth that you used to have with these, this individual. But there's a loss there. So there's a lot of, um, you know, ongoing grief, anticipatory grief that happens. And some caregivers may feel guilty that they feel this sense of loss because the person is still physically with them, but, um, you know, cognitively, they're, they're not the same or, or they're declining. So as you're caregiving and taking on this additional responsibility, um, you're also experiencing a sense of loss. And as we get further in the presentation, I'm just going to take a sip of tea here. So as we get further into the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about caregiver resiliency and that toolbox that I had uh, talked about in the introduction and how we can kind of use the Dementia Society to, to build our resiliency and to be able to get through some of the challenges that you may be experiencing now and you might experience um, in the future. So I just, I wanted to go back to this photo because um, this I believe is coming from uh, one of our exercise programs, Let's Get Moving. Um, so exercise as caregivers and keeping well is extremely important. And that's something I hadn't mentioned when I was talking about what we'd learn in the future of the presentation. 
So scope of caregiving responsibility. So if we took the role of caregiver and we broke it down into different job titles and descriptions, we kind of see here that there's um, about nine different titles, um, varying titles with each point that a caregiver will often assume as they take on this, this role and have these responsibilities. So as some of you might have um, learned is that we have uh, LIN care coordinators that are available um, for in-home support. And so a lot of times caregivers are pr providing this coordination, you know, they're keeping track of appointments, um, rehabilitation programs, you know, when the physio person is coming in, um, when the personal support worker, preposé is coming in. So it's a lot of uh, coordination and management. Um, nowadays with the COVID um, pandemic, recreation coordinator, so families and friends are now responsible for planning out activities and making sure that there's a sense of stimulation within their day, whether that be through, um, you know, fun activities that are appropriate for their level or having conversations and talking about things that they really enjoy. Another point is the advocate. So very often you have to speak on behalf for the care recipient, um, especially if you feel like um, their needs are not being prioritized or you're noticing things that um, need advocacy or need somebody to speak up and you know you should feel comfortable to do that. Very important um, to keep a journal, not only for yourself, but also just of everything you kind of go through. Um, because you'd be surprised when you'd go through about six months and then you look back and you just notice a lot of growth. And a lot of care caregivers have mentioned that the growth lies in advocacy. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so nurse, medication compliance, toileting, dressing, we tend to see this in later stages, but with medication compliance, you know, early, mid, and late stages. And of course, you know, depending on the relationship and the dynamic, um, it may be that this person just won't accept medication from you. And, and that's okay, you know, really find the strengths of your family and your friends and those that your loved one trusts and use those and uh, put together all your strengths onto a paper and that will create a team of, of things you can do for your loved one. Um, so example of that would be, um, you know, uh, Brother Bill really does well with finances and managing property and he enjoys this. So if any issues come up in terms of property or accounts, finances, Bill's going to take care of it. You know, um, the second, uh, second sister, Sally, <laughs> I'm so terrible with creative names, I'm sorry. Um, Sally um, is really good with, you know, create de-escalating um, emotional situations or states with mom. So, you know, she, and she's willing. So if, if mom needs any support, we're gonna call, we're gonna call Sally. So that's really working on each other's strengths. Um, counselor, so, you know, especially with the COVID pandemic can be really difficult to communicate what's happening. So a lot of times we wanna, we wanna keep on the side of, you know, warm, warm tones, reassuring touch if possible, um, redirection to happy things, um, open-ended questions where your loved one can really steer where she wants to go. And then you just go with the flow. So you're kind of taking on the role of counselor there by, um, by navigating and following where they'd like to go with the conversation. So housekeeper, for sure, especially if you're living with this individual, you know, as dementia progresses, it, things become more and more difficult. Um, and there may be a lack of insight, like we've learned, um, where the person does not have access into knowing that they have challenges and, are, and may be forgetting certain things. So this comes up a lot um, when it comes to housekeeping. Um, when we think of doing the dishes, um, it's very clear in our mind all of the steps that it will take to complete 
what is called doing the dishes. But for somebody with dementia, they're not able to kind of break down all of, all of those steps that equate to, to doing the dishes, like, you know, finding where the dirty ones are, piling the plates with the plates, the spoons with the spoons, filling the water with the dish soap, and then putting away um, the dishes appropriately into the correct shelves. A property manager and accountant, like we said, so the more complex tasks within the beginning of dementia tend, you know, as dementia progresses, the capacity tends to decline. So we see that in the beginning. So, you know, supporting that person into making well-informed financial decisions is really helpful. You're, you know, you can keep in mind that you're helping guide them to making, you know, well-informed, correct de decisions regarding their property and their finances. And of course, on top of that, you are a partner, you are a parent, you may be a grandparent, a sister, a brother, a friend, and a child. So we, when we think about our caregiver goals, while we're caregiving for somebody, number one, it would be that they're safe and can stay as long as possible in their home environment. Um, because it's routine, because they know what to expect. You know, for some, they might have been living in this property for 40 to 50 years. So taking them out of that can be, can be really challenging unless it's of course needed for safety. And that's what we always have to prioritize. Is the person safe? And are they happy? So when safety be, becomes an issue, that's when we need to start thinking about <clears throat> losing the home environment as a cost in order to, you know, have the value of, of knowing that person is safe. And um, yeah, so our next point is, our next goal is my loved one is stimulated, happy, and has social activities. So social activities has, has really changed over this last year. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things that you can do now um, that will still follow the social distancing rule, uh, rules, um, such as keeping six feet apart, wearing your masks, washing your hands, um, having an alcohol spray, mix spray um, that you can use on fabrics is helpful. Um, not having your shoes inside, but keeping them outside and spraying those down occasionally as well. And um, a hot tip that uh, a nurse from the Ottawa hospital told me is just spray down anything that could be touched uh, frequently. So uh, light switches, doorknobs, um, you know, walls. Kids tend to hold on to a certain spot in the wall as they curve around the stairs. So be aware of hot spots and twice a week just um, find a disinfectant that you can use to go over these spots. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Just, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, just a moment. Um, thank you for waiting. Um, so being stimulated means a variety of things. So um, keeping in mind their level of, of, of cognition, you want to pair an activity to that. So if they really enjoy music, you know, collecting some favorites from iTunes and then creating a special playlist would be really uplifting, I think. Um, Another goal is maintaining relationships. So as you take on the role of caregiver, sometimes the role of the role of daughter spouse can kind of, you know, wash away a bit because the priority is really being a caregiver. But there's a, there are ways that you can, um, you know, maintain this bond and continue to create moments that are special, um, bright, and, and, and some that you can add to, you know, the photo memory um, um, book for your family. So at the Dementia Society, when we're working with families, this is a number one goal, you know, how can we maintain the relationship as daughter and mom as this person's taking on more and more responsibility. So another one is reducing emotional pain and suffering. So a question that comes up a lot is, 
you know, should I tell my mom or dad that that they have dementia? And, you know, letting them know is important because they, they have a right to know what's happening with them. And I think that's an important conversation that should happen in the doctor's office um, with your loved one and yourself or the primary caregivers. And um, once it's told, you know, then we think about the value add, you know, if if um, I'm thinking about telling mom or dad that they might have dementia, is it because they're asking quite frequently? Um, is it because I feel like maybe during the appointment um, or they, they've forgotten since the appointment? So I should, I should remind this person, but we always go back to value add. And if in your mind this is going to cause distress, um, and the person is not asking, it's okay to, to avoid that, that kind of conversation. But if they are, uh, they are asking, making sure that the environment is, you know, warm and soothing, you might have a tea, and then, and then answering that question, you know, and be ready to support them through, through knowing that. And for them, it will probably feel like the first time. Um, but it's important to work with your dementia care coaches if this is kind of reoccurring situation because that's something we can we can walk you through. Um, so of course, as a caregiver, you want to reduce their emotional pain and their suffering. Um, prevent health problems for the person with dementia. So you know, um, reduce uh, reduce fall risks in the home. Um, ensuring that hygiene is appro followed appropriately to reduce to reduce um, medical issues, and of course maintaining mobility. Um, I think that um, one of the parts might have mentioned how important it is to exercise and keep the the body moving. This keeps the blood moving around the body, which brings oxygen to all those important parts. So. You yourself as the caregiver and the person with dementia, of course, to, as their ability allows, should, should try your best to stay, to stay mobile. But it is one of our uh, caregiver goals. So the goals that we listed, now we need to understand how do we reach those goals. So now we're going to get into that toolbox I was talking about. <clears throat> Sorry, so to reach these goals, um, caregivers may need to take some training and education. So um, kudos, you're, you're completing the last part of Dementia Basics. Um, I hope that it's opened up your ideas of what uh, dementia is or, or what it is not, um, because education a lot of the times can create um, understanding and patience. Um, and give us a sense of, of where, what our next steps might be. So um, navigation of our healthcare system. So this often changes um, year to year. So it's really helpful to have somebody that can help you navigate the healthcare system, like a care coordinator from the Lynn or a dementia care coach too. Um, so in order to complete your goal, you may need to have in-home support um, or private support from the community. And this is really nice because this helps our caregiver resiliency by having somebody come in. And of course, you facilitate this relationship and you help transition this person into the home. Um, but this person can take some of those um, activities of daily living, those tasks off of your hands, which leaves you room for respite, which recharges your batteries, which of course we all know goes back into the person that you love. Um, but also it leaves you more room to be daughter or son or spouse um, and just be a, a, um, a whole person that is able to um, complete activities um, for, for self, for social wellness, um, and to maintain relationships. Um, building a supportive network to help with significant transitions. So 
transitions is a big part of, of dementia. And it's important to find people that understand the complexities of the situation that you're undertaking. Um, just because it's it's an ease of communication. When when somebody kind of understands where you're coming from, there's a language that kind of forms or a bond. And knowing that other people are kind of challenged um, with similar things um, makes you feel less isolated, makes you feel like you have somebody to go to if you need to troubleshoot or if you need any support. Um, so building a supportive network also with professionals or community supports is really important as well. Advanced care planning. So, you know, I recommend that you have this conversation as a family as early as possible. Um, one, because this makes it a family activity and people are, tend to be a little bit more open maybe when they have their immediate family all doing it at the same time. Um, and it's a good excuse to, to have the conversation as well. Um, you also may review, may need to review and revise financial plans. So making sure that there's a power of attorney for care and property, but also, you know, linked to advanced care planning, you're having a discussion about your wishes so that when somebody takes on that power of attorney, um, they can still um, make decisions in the spirit of, of those wishes. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit in general about um, caregiving in Canada. So our sources, um, where the information was pulled is from Stat uh, Statistics Canada, General Social Survey on Caregiving and Care Receiving. So that's, um, you can publicly access this information. And we also pulled from the support received by caregivers in Canada, which was released January 8th, 2020. And Caregivers in Canada, comma 2018, that was also released January 8th, 2020. <laughs> So um, these reports just give you some good information about what other um, uh, Canadian caregivers are, are challenged with and how you're contributing to the economy and get a sense of your community as well. So caregiving was not limited to helping family members. The second most common care category of care recipient were close friends, colleagues, or neighbors at 16%. So what they're saying here is after family members, um, the next care recipients were close friends, colleagues, and neighbors. 27% uh, of caregivers reported caring for two um, and 15% for three or more family members or friends. So it says transportation and meal preparation were among the most com, uh, common caregiver tasks, followed by household work, scheduling and coordinating appointments, managing finances, helping with medication or treatments, and providing personal care. Um, so I just want to show everyone um, one of these posters that they released regarding um, caregivers in Canada. So I'll just pop up my screen here. So this is caregivers in Canada. Oh, sorry, it was released on January 8th. Um, so we can see here that most caregivers provided care to parents or parents-in-law. So that's definitely something that the team sees when we're supporting caregivers. So this is a really good read if you're interested, but also if I click on this link, um, they released a, um, a poster of some of the main um, 
results that they collected. So they saw that women represented the majority of caregivers in Canada. Um, but we, you know, we see a lot of men um, who are supporting families and that are in um, the caregiver role. Uh, here we go. So 72% provided transportation, 55% provided housework, which included meal prep, cleaning, and laundry, 45% house maintenance and outdoor work. And I'm assuming that this includes any kind of renovations or um, changes to the environment, such as handlebars or, or, or bar grabs, things like that around the shower and 40% scheduling and coordinating appointments. So if you think about yourself presently in the caregiver um, experience, kind of think about where your duties fall. Um, if most follow, uh, follow under transportation, housework, house maintenance, or coordinating appointments, and if it's similar to what Canada, give, uh, Canada caregivers have said. Another important point here is most caregivers provided one to three hours of care per week. So if we just look at this number, it may not feel like a lot, but we also have to look at, you know, if that person has a family, if that person has a full-time job, if they're going to school, you know, um, all of these create more, uh, a better picture of what actually the caregiver is going through. Oh, and actually, if we see here, a large majority, so 21% provide 20 or more hours per week. And if we look at um, 20 hours, I believe 25 is considered full time um, and 20 or more is what they've indicated. So part time to full time uh, caregiving. All right, so I'm gonna go back to our presentation over here. I'm just getting so quick with this uh, this Zoom thing. Well, maybe not quick, very, very quick. All right. Excuse me. So nearly nine in 10 caregivers, which is approximately 88 percent, 9 and 10 being a generalization, reported spending time with the person, talking and listening to them, cheering them up, or providing some other form of emotional support. So if we set aside all of the supports with activities of daily living, both complex um, and basic, we see a majority of the time um, caregivers like yourselves are um, soothing the person, talking to them, reassuring, reassuring them, listening to them, you know, navigating the conversation, not in terms of the content, but just knowing what to say, when to say it, you know, um, cheering them up and providing some other form of, a, of emotional support. So it kind of goes back to the different roles that you take on as a caregiver and counselor being one of them. One thing we have to remember that if we're giving a lot of this out, we have to keep in mind that in some ways it has to come back in. So we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail later. So um, they found in, they, well, they reported in 2012 that when they added indirect and direct costs, um, it surmounted to $33 billion um, for, for caregiving costs and support. That's a huge number. Um, so important thing to note is if you're eligible is to, to complete the disability tax credit, you can do it uh, um, retro, oh, what's that term? You can, you can go backwards and receive support from previous years so long as there, there was a diagnosis of dementia. And your family physician fills that information out and specifies um, the types of supports that this person needs. But that helps contribute towards those indirect costs. 
So some of these caregiver costs included dwelling modification, so handlebars, grab bars. That's the word, uh, so it's grab bars, excuse me. Um, hiring help for daily activities like walks, um, conversations, gardening, specialized devices or equipment, um, door alarms, um, you know, medic alert subscriptions, bracelets. Um, there's also GPS technology for shoes, bracelets, um, in phones, um, and prescription and non-prescription pharmaceuticals. So a lot of times there are specific diets that um, families will follow, um, such as the Mediterranean diet. So this might have additional costs. So that also falls under indirect costs. So the most common expenses fell under transportation, travel for visits and accommodation. And of course, amounts spent vary depending on the, the relationship between the care recipient um, and the caregiver. So I hope that this gives you a bit of a view of the caregiver contribution within Canada um, in terms of the financial contribution, but also the diverse um, set of responsibilities and skills that you undertake when you um, become a caregiver. Um, so with that, with that said, I do a lot of work around compassion fatigue, <clears throat> but namely um, becoming aware and being able to name that it is compassion fatigue. So this is a, a common term that we've been hearing more recently. And um, a lot of people in the helping professions um, and caregiving included will experience compassion fatigue. Um, this is because um, you are empathizing, you are caring for someone, um, you might be, you know, you're emotionally connected with this individual. So their challenges and their feats and successes become your own. And over time, taking on this stress, you know, for some it's, I'm, you know, taking care of a household, but I'm also looking after my mom. So you're taking additional responsibility onto yourself. And when we think about resiliency, it's not just, you know, what God gave you kind of thing. And, and if you can get through it, that means you're strong. And if you can't with what you have, then you're, you're weak. But in actuality, it's ensuring that there's a fit between what my responsibilities and my challenges are and what my supports and my resources are. So the more responsibilities that are on your shoulders, the more supports and tools in your toolbox um, and connections with the community um, that, are, that are the most important and they should equal the same amount. So Dementia Basics is a really good opportunity to start learning what can be in your toolbox and also to become comfortable with um, accepting help. Um, because that can be challenging too. I mean, I myself, you know, like to feel like I can take on everything because if I accomplish it, I can look back and say, whoa, I did a lot. But what you have to think about is like, I did a lot, but at what cost? You know, we want both a caregiver and person with dementia to, to feel like they're thriving um, throughout this. So don't feel that you are stuck with a certain amount of resiliency and if you can't get through it, you're weak and if you can, you're strong. It just means, oh, I need to reevaluate what's in my toolbox and what supports I'm reaching out for and become aware of when I feel like my tank and my capacity is kind of empty, emptied out a little bit. So a great tip is to, to make a list tonight, you know, the counselor like I am, homework, da 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 um, tonight or tomorrow morning, or just as it comes, I want you to um, make a list of the things that really fill up that tank, make you happy, make your light shine, you know, make you kind of laugh. Just start building this list because as stressors come in and you need a sense of 
you know, a breath or a break, you can go to this list and choose the one that fits, of course, your schedule and your time and everything and your energy level. Um, but it's nice to know, okay, I have this list if, if I really need to cheer up or I need to kind of refuel myself a bit. For me, it's puppies and babies, those two things, top of my list. And it, and it could be a strange, any baby, anybody's baby, any puppy. Um, okay, so with compassion fatigue, um, your tank is empty, you know, week after week um, goes by and your tank is still empty, you might be losing sleep, you know, appetite might be going up, might be going down, um, and you may not be realizing it or you may be feeling like you're an autopilot, right? Um, and as you're doing things, you might not be in touch with your friends and family like you would be. So no one's really saying, hey, you know, you're going really fast here. You maybe you need a, a time to pause so if you don't have that and things continue to go at the pace you might experience burnout um so that's when those tanks can continue it's kind of like a car right you're going towards empty you're on the highway eventually the tank will completely empty and you'll stall right and then you need to really ask for support like a tow truck there's somebody pick you up and bring you away um, and if you experience burnout, excuse me, if you have experienced burnout or you are now, you're not a weak person, you're not a bad person, it just means your, your, your love is kind of your love for your loved one and, and protecting them and being there for them is overcoming the the spirit of the relationship like what am what am i trying to say here um that you're prioritizing your loved one's needs over your own and that sounds good and dandy in the mean in in this moment but longevity wise it it's going to run out of gas and then both of you will be left you know without each other so um when we have burnout, the most important thing to focus on is to, to see it. Say, oh, I see you. Oh, I think I experienced burnout when this, 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 and this happened. Oh, that's right. Melissa did say I looked a little bit tired yesterday. Oh, okay, it's all kind of coming together. And that's how people usually become aware of, of burnout. Just takes time to kind of pull yourself out of autopilot and see and see yourself. For me, for instance, it's when I stopped listening to music and it takes days before I realize I've stopped listening to music, but I've written that one down and I said, okay, that's, that's good to remember. When music goes out, that means burnout's coming in. So it says with compassion fatigue, there's a few things that can impact these tanks, uh, these capacities. Um, so the progression of dementia, so depending on the version or the type, it's gonna have different behaviors, uh, different emotions, different experiences. So that can impact your own compassion fatigue and eventually uh, burnout. Um, specific behaviors of the person, so this kind of connects back to the first point. Access to supports. Um, so if you don't have um, access to supports that are fi filling the needs that you're expressing, then this can contribute to compassion fatigue. Um, informal or limited support networks. So for instance, we have, um, we have the grief support peer group um, that happens um, every second Tuesday of the month. Um, now that's limited support because that's a peer support group. It's not one-on-one -on -one and it's monthly. So it's limited until it's joined by, you know, individual counseling or other supports um, and provided also by a, a mental health professional. Um, caregiver characteristics and temperament. So for some people, um, you know, 
dementia becomes very frustrating. Um, they become impatient. They don't have as much understanding as, as they used to, so that will impact your compassion fatigue. It's hard to kind of not take that personally, even though we shouldn't. Um, I think it's the first response. Um, so it takes time to kind of learn to separate the response from the person. Um, nature of the relationship. So as I mentioned a bit in the beginning, there's different relationships between the care recipient um, and the caregiver. So we also have to respect that, but it will, it will contribute to compassion fatigue. Um, financial challenges and other um, family responsibilities. So just take a moment to think about um, some of those factors for yourself um, and maybe note down some of those things that might alert you to uh, compassion fatigue or, or burnout. And then don't forget your list that makes you feel um, bright. All right, so here um, we have another slide for burnout. And we have some physical indicators and mental indicators, and I'll just go through a couple of each. Um, so fatigue. So if you're noticing that you're going to bed um, and you're waking up and you're still tired, or you're waking up um, and it takes you a couple of hours to get up and get going, then we can recognize that there might be some fatigue. So that might be something you want to note down if you're currently or you have felt that way. So sleeplessness is more to do with the, the quality of the sleep. Um, if you're restless in bed, if you're stirring a lot or you're having multiple, multiple awakenings. Of course, if your loved one is, is also waking up, which is prompting you to wake up, this is also a physical indicator of sleeplessness. A uh, loss of appetite because um, <clears throat> a loss of appetite because your adrenaline system is um, is circulating and it's and it's active and you're hyper vigilant and you know so when the system is is in the fourth is is the one that's active. Um, then you're less inclined to, to become hungry, less inclined to eat. Um, headaches, so tension headaches, dizziness, heart palpitations, chest pain. So this can also be indicators of, um, of course, burnout is just a, another, ver another way of saying prolonged stress and reaching kind of the peak of prolonged stress. So um, mental indicators, oh, and just, if you're having chest pain combined with heart palpitations, combined with dizziness, combined with um, headaches, you should still go to uh, the hospital to, to, to be checked out, especially having, if you're having pain. Um, depression, cynicism, feeling overwhelmed. So this feeling is kind of like when you're treading water, you're just constantly trying to stay right above the water, like the, your head is just above that, that, um, that line. So if you're feeling like you're waking up just to kind of, in order to do the day, in order to go to bed, to, to wait, then you might be feeling overwhelmed, you know? And with that comes irritability. Um, you know, don't be too hard on yourself if you're a little bit more short with certain family members that you trust and that you love. Um, this just might be a sign that that you're a little bit, um, you have some prolonged stress and some, a break, some respite, or a new routine might, might need to be put in place to help. Social isolation. <laughs> Well, I think we're all kind of experienced a bit of social isolation also. So immediately that's a that's a factor for all of us. Hypervigilance, so this kind of speaks to that adrenaline system when you know you're really focused on being actionable and completing things done and getting this done and getting that done. Um, that you're constantly on alert, which can affect your sleep and your appetite. 
and self-harming behavior. So sometimes um, people might hurt themselves because um, there's a sense of chaos when it comes to emotions about what's happening in the situation that, you know, your brain just hasn't digested what's happening. So people will sometimes harm themselves to feel something distinct, specific, which is, I hurt myself, I feel pain, A, B, C, it makes perfect sense kind of thing. Um, important to reach out to somebody to talk about this um, and to share your story because there might be help there where you can replace that coping strategy with one that's a little bit healthier um, and focuses on thriving. Now what? So we've learned all about these things, now what? So we've learned a little bit about um, burnout, the indicators, the mental indicators. Um, some feelings you might have that are washing together, maybe frequently, are grief, anger, and guilt. Um, you know, by all means, raise your hand if you, feel, if you felt any of these emotions or a combination of any of these emotions. Um, a lot of times caregivers feel grief because they're losing the person, their temperament, their personality, anger because they can't stop it. Um, you can't, you know, change it for the person. Um, you know, you might not have wanted this responsibility. You might be angry that they're being taken away. Um, you might be also confused that, you know, you're feeling this way, but they're still here. And so then you feel guilty. So they all kind of wash together sometimes. Being aware of these feelings is important um, for your own wellness. And so things don't pile up and then, you know, come out of nowhere um, because we, we don't want, we want to avoid like crisis situations or situations where you're feeling out of control or, you know, outpouring of feelings, better to get them out a little bit at a time as you feel them. Although, you know, sometimes they do just come out pouring and that's okay too, especially when you get some bad news or there's a big change that happens. Um, so one thing is just journaling, you know, we're keeping track of appointments and tasks and financial matters, but um, do keep, I'm holding on to mine right now, um, do keep a, a log and journal of yourself and how you're, you're feeling throughout this journey because I'm telling you in a few years when you look back into the beginnings, you're going to see a lot of growth, a lot of change, and it's going to be specific and detailed because you took the time to write it down. But also if you're feeling a burst of feelings, like for instance, all of a sudden you feel grief, anger, guilt, um, you know, we call it a brain dump. You just kind of write everything out. And then as time passes and you're feeling like the situation has de-escalated, you can go back to these words and kind of make sense of how you're feeling at that time. So it's creating more awareness. I hope, I hope that helps, um, helps some of you. So now we're getting into caregiver resiliency. So that toolbox I was talking about. Um, so health, family dynamics, mental, emotional status, culture, religion, spirituality, community involvement, daily routine. All of these things can really support your toolbox and your sense of resiliency. So how I get through challenges and what do I use to get through challenges? Um, so health, so staying healthy, having an active routine, you know, it doesn't mean you have to go out and run a marathon. It can mean just a nice walk down to your mail every day or, you know, meet with a neighbor and walk down the street. Um, but keeping an eye on your health um, and being on top of that the same way you're on top of it for your loved one is really important because then you're, you're keeping an eye out on the team instead of individual team members. 
So family dynamics, um, you know, like I was saying, really draw on the strengths of the people that are around you. And if somebody's offering you support and help, do do use it and be specific where you can use use help. You know, if it's in meal preparation, then, you know, if you trust this person, then ask if they're offering, you know. Um, also keeping a list, a caregiver had mentioned this, keeping a list of things that you need help with is really good because if somebody says, you know, if there's anything I can do, just let me know. He said, pull out the list and say, well, here you go, like any, any one of these, but actually it's helping with communication and people do want to help. So when they can help in a very practical, specific way, well, we're, we're being a community together. Um, so mental and emotional status. So, um, you know, if you're, if you've gone through a lot in your, in your past, um, maybe getting some extra support around your mental and emotional well-being would be helpful as you're caregiving. So having a counselor, a therapist, or joining a group would be really helpful because it's just supporting your resiliency or adding to it. Um, culture, religion, and spirituality is really important. Um, nature, um, it allows us to see the bigger picture, the flow of life, um, how generations impact one another and inform inform one another. You know, it just makes us remember why we're doing this and um, being grateful and feeling blessed, I think, is a big part of the the process um, and finding those little beautiful um, happy moments becomes more of a challenge but when you do find it um, it's so rewarding community involvement so helping others um, contributing that might be you know you're doing a full-time job you're contributing in other ways daily routine so stretching in the morning or creating a really great morning routine where maybe you're putting a journal entry or dreams you had that night. Um, you may have a glass of water and a black coffee, but do something that is just your kind of morning routine um, because that can just really make sense of, you know, especially when you're dealing with a lot of the unknown with your loved one, um, filling in the times. Um, and making them scheduled and breaking them down can be really comforting and you know something you don't have to worry about but i mean other people like like that to not know and be spontaneous so you know you know the you know yourselves best so really creating a toolbox that is unique for you is is a is a challenge but an important one Oh, what does caregiver resiliency mean to you? So what are some of the ways we can increase our caregiver resiliency? So we did talk about some, um, but we're going to talk about these four points. And uh, if you look closely, um, the letter of each word, so it spells out rash. So every time, you know, you think about your resiliency, think about your rash and uh, be realistic, accepting think about your social supports, and make healthy choices. So let's go through those. Realistic. So it can be really difficult to learn the science behind the dementia because, like myself, I heard some things I wasn't really prepared for. But, you know, it was an emotional cost, but the gain was that I, I really understood and I could set my expectations based on that information. So understanding what is happening with your loved one is just helping join them in their own reality and knowing what's going on for them um, and it'll help you be a better advocate too so establish and adjust your expectations um, set your expectations to what they can and cannot do and be open to um, being wrong and um, that there'll be good days and that there are going to be bad days. And for some, there might be good 15 minutes and the next might not be so good. So every day is very much different. So 
So except, um, and with dementia, change will always be happening, will always be constant, and acceptance really happens throughout with each change. So you allow yourself to feel, allow yourself to let it matter, and um, reach out for support um, when you feel you need it. You may feel guilty, you know, asking and receiving support, but that's just a part of the process. And if you're not used to doing that, it's going to feel uncomfortable at first. So social support is critical enhancing uh, resiliency and can take many forms. So because of the COVID pandemic, we're learning many different ways of being social. Um, that can be so through social media. Um, that can be through FaceTime um, appointments with friends and family. That can mean garden visits, uh, garden long distance visits. Um, formal programming such as dementia support program and community programs. Um, so the living room um, a music, live music a series is a way that people can um, join their community and um, have some fun as well. And I find when you listen to music, I don't know, it just, uh, for me, it fills up my tanks, especially when you're clapping along and you're no big smile on your face. Um, so informal peer support. So benefits include having someone who understands your situation. So a lot of our caregivers will meet others in our support groups and then form a relationship outside of uh, the support group where they meet for lunch or they talk over the phone um, and build a friendship. Because like we said, like I said, it's a it's kind of just easier to communicate with somebody that understands and gets it and um, might be able to guide you or you guide them, which, you know, you're contributing back into the community, which feels really good as well. Um, so just to go back to um, working with trained professionals to develop care plans and get important referrals. So it's told it's completely okay to to call the Dementia Society and say, I would like to build up my toolbox. I'm a caregiver. Um, and I want to make sure that I have the right supports in place um, for my resiliency. So we can totally help you with that and prepare a plan, a care plan, and then complete goals as they come, create new ones, um, or, you know, complete and close the plan. It all depends on what you really need. We're pretty flexible in that sense. So we will follow your lead. And finally, the H of the acronym of RASH. Uh, caregiver stress is considered a health risk, so making healthy choices can help with resiliency. Eating well, staying hydrated. You know, I recently, Herman, I'm just going to do a very quick story. I recently um, bought this scale, this smart scale, and it actually tells you how much water um, percentages in your body and for me I drink bottles upon bottles of water every single day and I was expecting you know this A plus mark and I was astounded it was still lower than average so you know really look into how much water is appropriate for your size and ensure you're staying hydrated um, practice good sleep hygiene as much as you can aromatherapy soft music having a set time, a bedtime and wake up time um, and speaking to your doctor if you're having multiple awakenings you know you're waking up in cold sweats or having you know um, many um, uh, what, uh, flash, uh, hot flashes, Sissa. hot flashes, um, it's important to speak to your doctor about your sleep hygiene, um, because without sleep we can't, we can't do much. Um, exercising daily, and caregivers often forget to make their own doctor's appointments. I wonder, I wonder if anybody's smiling right now and nodding, being like, oh, that's me. So, um, 
being in charge of your loved one's care, but also being in charge of your care, making sure, um, you know, physicals are completed, um, referrals and uh, tests are done. Um, so caregiver respite uh, strategies. So uh, creating a toolbox with a dementia caregiver, you could dementia <laughs> care coach, you can also create um, a respite plan. Um, so this is where you can get uh, time away to kind of refuel that tank. So we can help facilitate medical referrals identify community resources such as counseling, such as group support, uh, coordinate in-home services with the LIN, and short-term respite options. So three common types of respite care, um, adult day programs, some are becoming virtual, in-home relief care such as a uh, preposé or personal support worker, overnight stay programs um, at long-term care facilities. So just at the bottom here, we have guest house, which is a short-term 12-bed um, respite facility. So counseling, working with a counselor to address emotional stress can help alleviate burnout short and long-term. And again, that self-care. Finding strategies that really help refuel your tank and not take away from your tank. So a lot of people, you know, we have exercise at the first, as the first point here, but if you feel like going to a class or going to the gym is adding more to your plate, then don't do that. You know, do, do more of a simpler exercise at home with a video on YouTube, um, something where you'd feel more comfortable and that you're re-energizing yourself as opposed to uh, draining yourself. Um, listening to music can be really soothing, really calming, um, and if you do play it around bedtime, your brain will start to learn um, this kind of music means bedtime, means release melatonin, means go to bed. Uh, lavender is really good for that as well. Oh, and a big point is group activities not related to caregiving. So book club, you know, it doesn't have to be five hours a week. It can be something brief, one hour per week where you're joining a group or a meetup group, something that kind of pulls you out of the sphere of, of caregiving. So just a little bit more on dementia care coaches. Um, so we provide education, supportive counseling, and referrals to other specialized services. So we do facilitate support groups with, um, with well-trained volunteers, and we offer social programming all online at the moment. Um, and we assist you to develop uh, care plans and self-management strategies. Um, system navigation of the healthcare system, as well as just asking some, answering some pointed or specific questions um, related to your situation. And we provide these um, by telephone and in person. We also have a live chat on our DementiaHelp.ca website, and we also offer Zoom appointments as well. So you just let, you just let us know what, what's best for you. So here's uh, some of the things that we do. Um, keep in mind um, the weekly roundup is found on our website and the weekly roundup lists all of our online activities for the upcoming week. They also have links and attachments to the registration um, through Eventbrite. So it's all pretty easy to get through. Um, but if you have any challenges, just give us a call and we'd be help, uh, happy to, to walk you through it. Ooh, 